Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell us what's happening on today's episode? Today, we're going to start by talking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Uh, because you have to. You have to. And then we're going to talk about how teaching women's history, especially the history of Rome, is not about feminism. All right. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, The Other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. All right, episode 10. Yes, we've been doing this for 10 episodes. That is nuts. Yeah. And the theme of this episode is it's not about feminism. Oh, and we have to start with RBG over yes. the last week. Oh my goodness. So if for those listening who don't already know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg recently passed away. Um, she was an incredible leader. She was on the Supreme Court. She was a lawyer. She moved the needle for so many women. I just thought we could read off some of the incredible things that she's done for women and just honor her for a second because I've been living in this. I know you had like mentioned it last week on Instagram of like, it just sucks like that we've lost her, but it also means that this is where we pick up the torch. Yeah. So So Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the second female justice to ever sit on the Supreme court. And it's crazy that, you know, this is our parents and grandparents lifetime that the second woman is ever on that court ever in the history of our country. It's crazy that there's still not an equal number of women to men on the Supreme mm-hmm. Court. Like that, that still blows my mind in, in 2020. Yeah. She, uh, in her first law class ever, she was one of several women and they were asked by their law professor on one of the first days of class, what justified them taking a seat from another man who, you know, deserved that spot. And to just deal with that degree of sexism from go, I could see a lot of people not wanting to soldier on. And not only did she soldier on through law school, but through lots of degradation and frankly, you know, garbage treatment from, from employers, from others to, to get to where she, she was. So Brooke, tell us a couple things that we have Ruth Bader Ginsburg to thank for. Yeah. Big ones um, that Ruth had brought to, um, to justice was the right to sign a mortgage without a man the right to have a bank account without a male co-signer, the right to have a job without being discriminated based on gender, the right for a woman to be pregnant and have kids and work, the right to a pension equal to male counterparts, um, the right to receive widower social security benefits. There's so many things. Yeah, the list just goes on. I mean, and then you can talk about all of her dissent in the recent years that she has written into the Supreme Court and the amazing things that she's done. But she's moved the needle not only for women equal rights, but also for some men as well. A lot of the, one of the first cases she took was a man who... White pass, right? He, no, he was caring for an elderly parent, and he wasn't allowed to get a tax credit mm. for doing that. And so... I think one of the cool things is, is this is like way beyond women's rights. It's about like, like this, this construct of gender and the idea that like, that like this guy who's doing quote unquote, a woman's job can't get, you know, tax benefits or whatever for, for doing that job just because he's a man that doesn't make any sense. And like, let's make this about rights. These are, these are human rights. If this is, you know, a treatment that's available for one person, then it should be available for any person based, you know, regardless of their gender. But it's crazy that like in her lifetime, in my grandmother's lifetime, that these, you know, that women, like I could like, that is such a basic thing to be able to get a loan, to get a mortgage, to get a credit card. You're able to do with that you know, like in what your independence means at that point to be able to care and provide for your family if you have one or yourself. Yeah. You know, that that's 
that's basic American rights that we should have access to. So I've been thinking a lot about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her legacy and how you should teach about her in yeah. class. And I found it really challenging to think about, because I, I was asking myself, like, how many Supreme Court justices do I mention by name in in class, because a lot of times I like I don't, you know, it might we might mention a Supreme Court case, but we might like the justice yeah. who wrote the opinion on it. You know, Probably we might not, not name think about the ones Brown, Brown versus Topeka. Exactly, yeah, or Roe v. Wade or, you know, the ones that everyone's kind of probably heard about. But like who who wrote the opinion? You don't necessarily know. No. Yeah. So the justices that I name in class Marshall he was one of he basically like made the Supreme Court what it is um I mentioned Tanny who was very anti-Lincoln during so he controlled he was um the head of the Supreme Court when Lincoln was president and he was very much opposed to to Lincoln he didn't get a chance to have this trial argued at the Supreme Court, but he basically said that Lincoln was a dictator and had violated habeas corpus and all these different things. Um, I I do teach about Brown versus Topeka because it desegregated schools and you have to. And so I will mention Thurgood Marshall and then later mention that he's the first black man on the Supreme Court. Um, but do you talk about, like, lawyers that, you know, did anything revolutionary as a lawyer? So if it's relevant to the bigger themes. Okay. And so I think that that's where that's your token to bring in Ruth Bader Ginsburg, because you just, Brooke, you just read this wonderful list of all these things that she oh accomplished gosh. for women. And so, you know, talking about what's going on for women in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and um and that they do have these ways that they are you know the system basically is rigged to keep them from being able to be self-sufficient and and then you have justices like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and other women in, you know, various courtrooms around the country who are are making arguments, legal arguments that rip these practices to shreds and define them as unconstitutional. So I think I could, you know, you could highlight a specific I don't think that many um, like you could highlight a specific court case that she was involved in sure. that was related to women's rights. And I think that would be wonderful. You could read some of her dissents that she's written because dissents tell us a lot about the debate, especially when it's a close debate. And so pick a case that was particularly cr- close and yep. and look at, you know, OK, here's what, you know, the opinion was. And then here's what the dissent said. Um, I think that gives you a really good snapshot of time too, you know, and I think about some of the recent ones they've done of just, you know, gender and, and trans and, you know, a couple different things that they've brought to the table. Um, and her dissents. Yeah. Really interesting to kind of just show the differences between administrations, you know, between Obama and Trump or even Bush and, and Obama, you know, there's a lot of like, okay, well, this is how we were in, in 2000, 2001. So we were in 2008 where are the differences in doing that just position? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is is hard to stomach. It feels like, and I think this is probably just being in the moment of it, but it feels like she was holding up this great defense of women's rights in this in this process. We're now over a week away from her passing, so I want to just take a minute and play my sort of immediate reaction. This was something I put up on social media the day afterward, Um, and her death, of course, was accompanied by uh, Constitution Day, where President Trump sort of attacked uh, history education um, in in a separate you know, separate event. So I want to, I want to play, um, that video that I, that I have posted. Hi everybody. I'm just having one of those mornings where my mind is running a million directions. Yesterday hit me hard. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died 
And I have been thinking a lot about how important she is. Brooke texted me yesterday and actually told me. And our exchange went a little something like this. It went, RBG died. And I said, I'm devastated. And she said, fuck 2020. <laughs> That woman carried so much on her shoulder. And I think about the SNL skit where they showed her holding up her, you know, to-do list. And of course, this woman's battling cancer. She's still coming to, you know, be present at, at trial and write her opinions. And she's carrying, you know, the burden of maintaining balance on the Supreme Court and women's rights on the Supreme Court. And I want her to rest and let the rest of us carry this burden that she's been carrying for a long time. And it's one of those moments where we all have big shoes to fill. And we have a big burden to carry that she's been carrying for a long time. In addition to that, yesterday, the president addressed the nation from in front of the Constitution and basically declared that he wanted to reform history education. And this is one of those moments as a history teacher that I get really excited that my field is is being discussed. And then I get horrified by how it's being discussed. I am not in this business to create little patriots loyal to the president and the president's political opinions. I am in this business of teaching the most accurate version of the past that I can. And I might make mistakes, but I am trying to tell the whole story. And if we only tell a small version of the story, then we're not telling the story. So I'm taking some deep breaths this morning and I'm going to get back to work because we've got a lot of work to do. So let's go. Oh my goodness. There's a lot to unpack there, but I want to skip ahead to what we now know, which is Donald Trump has made his appointment to the Supreme Court. Her name is Amy Coney Barrett, and um, she has made statements that uh, lead experts to believe that she would support overturning Roe v. Wade. This appointment will be historic. It will be the third, which is more than most presidents have ever had a chance to appoint. Um, and it will tip the balance of the Supreme Court to be conservative, which um, it has been relatively moderate for the last decade or so. And so it will be conservative. And um, this woman is 48 years old, so she would have a very long lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. Um, so we would be seeing a, a conservative court for many decades to come. I think it's really exciting that Trump has committed to appointing a woman to the court. Um, he has so far appointed two men and done very little to, you know, fix the gender balance on the Supreme Court. So I think that's really amazing. But I think it's really tricky when we're talking about you know, the legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and now appointing a woman who is going to really challenge a lot of the things that Ginsburg stood for, you know, the ability to be independent, to be independent, right, which Ruth Bader Ginsburg stood for. So it's hard to see it in that context. Women to make the same choices about their lives as men. I don't know why it's that complicated. <laughs> yeah. It's like if a man gets health coverage for erectile dysfunction, then a woman should get health coverage for yeah. birth control. I just, I, yeah, sorry. If she's advised by her doctor to do X, why should the government yeah. be involved in that? Anyways, I, that's all, that's all we're asking for. Yeah. So it's with a sad, heavy heart that yeah. we discuss, wine yeah, wine glasses full that we discuss but I think this is a good segue into the topic that you want to get to tonight. It's, you know, it's really interesting, her fight for feminism, but not, you know, always just saying that women should be, you know, above men. She just wanted equal. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Brooke, you're right. This is a perfect segue. So let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. 
If you think what we're doing is awesome, follow along on Instagram at Remedial Herstory. You can also go to our website to access all of the teaching resources that we've mentioned in our podcast, www.remedialherstory.com. Feel free to get in touch with us there about coming to see a live recording or sharing an idea you have for a lesson. If you would like to support our work and get some great perks along the way, go to www.patreon.com slash remedial herstory. You can also get that link through our website by clicking on support our work and you can pledge your support. You can give at various tiers and get different perks. This includes bonus materials, extended episodes, gear, and a whole lot more. We want to give a special shout out to our patrons. Thank you for making it possible for us to do this work, getting the stories of women into the hands of girls and boys so that we can help tell a more accurate history. So a um, couple years ago, and I'm not familiar with the... Um, with the video game, but a couple years ago, a video game came out. I'm sure gamers out there know what this was. I might know this one. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I don't know the name. So, um, a video game came out that was ancient warfare, and they were highlighting Roman warfare strategies okay. in this video game. That's all I know. Don't ask me more details. And um, in their video game, they had women characters that like you know avatars or whatever and some people were like up in arms that the feminists have taken over video gaming so the theme of today is it's not about feminism and it cracks me up because here are these I'm going to call them nerds. Is that okay? I think you can you can say that. Yeah, they're so gaming loud. nerds who, like, are all hyped up on video games plus history. So, like, that's a whole historical category. Yeah, yeah, historical game. That's a, that's a category in and of itself. So, um, they this is couldn't a- even fathom that women might have fought for or against Rome. Like that they would even be there. That they would even be there. And so, okay, so not only are they history nerdy people, but they have bad history nerdy people. Okay, I looked it up. I had to, I'm, you know, nerdy enough to want to know what this game is. So creative, in 2018, Creative Assembly's Total War Rome 2 was updated to include playable female characters. And this this update triggered a huge backlash and wave of review bombing. Yeah. So people basically hated on this video game because they, they couldn't even believe that women might have fought in Rome. So, um, so that just women have fought in every war pretty much ever. And so like that needs, wait, wait, wait. you need to like take a beat. Women have fought in every war since ever. ever. Since ever. Pretty much ever. In some way, shape, or form. And not just in like, oh, my my home is being raided, so I'm defending my family. No, like, like, took up arms. No, like, took up arms, wore a uniform in every war like ever. The problem is, and the, re- you know, the whole anonymous was a woman, right? Yes. Same, same issue. Women were doing it maybe illegally maybe wrongly and we so we only know that they did it because they died and people found their bodies and were like oh this is the body of a woman right because we talked in last episode about trans and transgender women and yep and and not really you know not really being able to know like is this person trans is this person female like how would they have identified we don't know but we know that we have a biologically female person fighting on a battlefield, wearing armor, dead in mud, right? So, like, we know that they did it. 
So, um, so that needs, that understanding needs to be taught to kids in school so that they don't find a video game that features women and go, oh, the feminists are after us. Like, cause it's not about that. No, cause according to the little article that I read, actually that gaming company had like a ton of historians that looked up facts to make sure that they had accurate costuming and details about those women on the game. Right. Right. So then, then that gets into, there were actually like women warriors who were well known. And I think the most well known women warriors who took up arms against Rome would probably be Cleopatra. Ooh. Right? So she and Mark so so okay, there's a lot to Cleopatra that we probably don't need to get into here, but she um had a relationship with Caesar. She had a child that was a threat to to the Roman, the, the Roman Empire because it they people think that it was C- she named the child Caesar, right? She has a relationship with Mark Anthony and um she and he take up arms using her army right and they lead against rome and this is a fraught endeavor um she dies she commits suicide and you know he kills himself when he finds that she is is dead um some you know maybe she committed suicide by having a snake bite her maybe she died accidentally pretty sure it was a suicide um But, you know, like, that's probably the most well-known story. What is less well-known is that Cleopatra, the one that we're talking about and the one that everybody knows her name, she was sort of the end of a long line of Cleopatras. Cleopatra, you know, the former and latter and, you know, and then you get all the way down to Cleopatra the millionth. And it's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah, everybody's Cleopatra, just like everybody's Caesar, you know. So um, Cleopatra, uh, her, you know, ancestors all took up arms and, you know, had armies and commanded and ruled and um, resisted Rome. And so so she's not she's not the first nor, you know, nor is she. Well, she's the last Cleopatra, but she's not the last woman to to fight against against Rome. Um, before her in other parts of the Roman empire, um, two women kind of stand out to me. And it's, it's interesting because I took a class, uh, on Roman history and I remember learning about Hannibal and how he marched, you know, all the way around the Mediterranean and led his troops. And he, he tried multiple times to sack Rome and failed. And so in his last attempt, he like leads elephants through the Alps and they like all freeze and it's bad. And, but I like, I remember all these details about Hannibal and this sort of like fraught invasion and like, why, like, this is again, like, why do I know his story, but not his story in the bigger picture of pretty much anybody that was outside Rome is trying to resist Roman expansion and maintain their autonomy. And Rome is expanding rapidly. And so it's interesting because Hannibal's only one of many people who who did that, that are doing that. Um, you know, we have women, we've got women. So, so Rome eventually reaches modern day, the United Kingdom. And it was called Britannia at the time. And, um, there was a, um, so Britannia had all these different tribes, um, and, or sorry, modern day, the United Kingdom had all of these different tribes and, um, so the Celts were one of them. Okay. And um, when Rome came in, they killed the king and his wife, her name was Boudicca, had. Yes. yes. So someone who's listening to this podcast who named their child Boudicca, please write in. <laughs> yeah, please. And do that. Um, so Boudicca has some daughters through the king and um their daughters were raped by Roman soldiers. And so Boudicca goes straight cray. And <laughs> rightfully so. Rightfully so. Um, she was, no, she was impassioned and um, led armies against Rome. And um, oh she was like on a chariot in battle fighting Rome. There are statues to her in 
in the United Kingdom today okay. on, you know, on a chariot in battle. And, um, and so, he, and she won many, many battles and then was ven- eventually lost, you know, okay. cause Rome was big and that's why we know Rome and not her, but did away with chariots. <laughs> <laughs> we figured this one out. <laughs> it just became more like a professional war. Time. When something more efficient and lightweight replaced it. So no longer a <clears throat> paddy wagon with wheels. We are now going to ride the physical horse. <laughs> right. So on the other side of the Roman Empire in modern day Syria, there is a woman named Zenobia. Okay. And Zenobia was even more successful than Boudicca in resisting Rome. When Rome came near her, she not only led her people against them, but she won. And she kept Rome out of her... get it. Right? And so, like, why like why are we learning about Hannibal? Like, okay, Hannibal was scary, maybe. But, like, so was Boudica. She was crazy. You raped yeah. her daughter. Like, you're done. She's and killed her husband. Like, you. you're done. Yeah. She's coming. Right? Like, Zenobia is also really interesting, but she was also successful. Like, she blocked people from getting into her kingdom. So, so blocked Rome. Blocked Rome, right? <laughs> like, this is, this is the, the Rome that we're talking yeah. about. Um, so I think, so I think that's really interesting. And I just want to expand a little bit because when I teach world history, I, you know, we try to zoom out a lot because you want, there's so much going on and you, it can become very Western centric if you just teach Rome. And so I like to highlight for kids that the Han empire in China is happening at the exact same time. And which is fascinating in its own right. And and similarly, like, came to power in very similar ways, um, was expanding in very similar ways, mm-hmm. and making people pay tribute. You know, like, it, it yeah. seems like it's like Rome-China version. Um, so the Han Empire, as they're expanding, also faced resistance from women. And uh, two women in particular, they were sisters, um, oh. the track... Uh, Trung Track and her sister were from Vietnam and rode on elephants. So they're cool. You know, if we like Hannibal and his elephants, like let's talk about two women who rode elephants into battle. So the cool thing too, that I don't know that we're mentioning is that these women also inspired men and others to To follow. follow. Yes. And to lead when we talk about this often that women don't aren't allowed to have a voice or can't speak in public or can't you know get up and say the things that they need to say and yet despite that and despite that of yep. what we know and what we've been told about this time period and and certainly of what was expected of women you have these powerful women that are not going on these so there's these powerful women that are not going on solo missions they're not sneaking into a castle in the middle of the night they're taking up an entire army against these huge powerhouses like Rome, they were scary and they were everywhere. Yep. Like people, you know, the more you know about Rome, like they expanded so far yep. all the time that you never knew when they were going to attack or how or when or why. And like for you to take up an entire army against them, that's bold and incredible. Yeah. So these sisters in Vietnam, sim- kind of similar to Boudicca. And I love when you can find patterns and similarities. Yes. Like, uh, I think Trung Trak's uh, husband was killed, you know? And so she, like, takes up, she, like, takes his place, takes up Basically arms. The story is, don't make a woman mad. Yeah. And that She will take up an army against you. Yeah, that's the end. Okay. So she she takes up an army with her sister and they they lead, they govern, they appoint their mom and they, they have a bunch of different generals that are like leading troops. Okay. Their mom is one of the generals leading troops. And well, you'd have to imagine that the woman that birthed these two, these two women, yeah, gotta be pretty bad. <laughs> she, yeah, pretty baller. So their mom is leading them and um, they win. Uh, several battles in in their resistance against the Han, and then um, eventually, you know, things kind of dwindle. And um, th- th- one of the accounts I read 
said that um, a lot of people began deserting because they didn't think that women could could win. And so that's interesting because it's like that gendered factor. Also, they were winning. Representation matters. Yeah. If you haven't seen a woman do it before, then you don't have precedent to say that it'll happen again. Totally. So um, their story is kind of sad. They they end up Boudicca dies on battlefield. Um, they end up uh, drowning themselves in the river. Whoa. That's a choice. So, um, but so I guess I point that out to say that this isn't like oh Western you know progress or whatever. Yeah. Like no, like this is happening in China as well. And you know, like in class, you should be comparing and contrasting civilizations in any world world well, class. Give equal mic time to women and men yeah you don't focus on one or the other it can be equality there no and and so in vietnam today they celebrate those sisters they have like they have like celebrations and i think that's really like that's a really special part of their heritage right like we're not china we are like our own people Yeah, yeah we're vietnam so um so anyway i think i think this is a really important it we learn history at young ages. And I know that people teach Roman history very early. We teach about Greek gods and the Pantheon and all these things. And like, why not teach it accurately and, and not do the same thing that everybody has always done where we're deleting characters because they're female for, for no good reason. Um, and I think it's, it's, really problematic and incredibly frustrating that kids grow up thinking like, oh, the reason that we have women characters in X movie or we have women characters yeah. in this is because of feminists. No, it's because it happened. It's accurate. <laughs> it's accurate. That video game that you are playing at nighttime, young child, is accurate that there were women there. Right. They fought in Rome and they continue to fight. And then you think about a lot of the military games that are coming out now too. It's like, there's women in the military, FYI. Yeah, I play Call of Duty all the time, which don't tell anybody that. But uh, like, there's no, <laughs> told all of us. you know, there's no like female characters. I don't know. It's sad. Oh, there isn't. No, Call of Duty. What it it exemplifies is that our mindset framework is for the military is male. And that might be true, like in their time, the laws might have said, send me your sons, right. you know, but it like that it is not that women did not fight and did not fight on the like, battlefield in see, other ways. Uh, a, a war in any type of time period, the female is always portrayed as a victim in that scenario or leverage mm-hmm. or a trading, pe- like something that is a thing and a possession versus a person, individual, and that has an opportunity to do something against whatever that power is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that, you know, and presently people, the Americans are fighting this battle. We had only recently, did we have a few women pass the U S army Rangers test, yes. like one of the hardest you know, tests. And there are still branches in the military that are barred to women. But I think a huge piece of this is our historical framework that suggests that this is not a woman's place. And we don't have examples in our repertoire of Zenobia, of Boudicca, of, you know, Trung Trak and her sister, like leading, leading troops, participating with troops, um, and and I think that if we had that representation, if we had those names in our repertoire, it would not be so scary. We would not have the rampant, you know, yeah, sexism that we have in on military bases. We wouldn't have military personnel constantly needing to be trained on how to treat women, you know, like it, just if we realize that women belonged here and have belonged here forever. Well, it's the same. It's a peer. You know, a female is not a female in, you know, on your team. They are a peer to you and they can help you in X, Y, Z way, just like a man can help you. It's like, why does that need to be explained or defined? But it's because we were never taught those things in in coursework, that there was already women there. So if people want to include this in their classroom, 
Yeah. So there's a lot of different resources out there. And, um, I first want to highlight a couple different ones because some of them are, are, I didn't make them and that makes it way more fun for me. So, um, the history channel recently had a, uh, series called barbarians rising and they probably in like a Western centric way highlighted Boudicca, not Zenobia, but Boudicca is awesome. And, um, and that series was really good. I, it was entertaining and I think kids would get a, get a good kick out of it. Um, so I, I highly want, I just want to plug barbarians rising, um, just cause they do, they do recognize Boudicca's work. Um, there are, I have, a com- kind of contrasting um, lesson plan available for people where you read a little bit about Boudicca, you read a little bit about Zenobia, and you can choose to also have them read about Trung Trak and her sister and her okay. mother. And um, and these are secondary source accounts. So most of the stuff that I've put up recently has been primary source accounts. These are secondary source accounts, but it's looking at three different stories of women who fought against big empires and the challenges that they faced and just having kids do a little bit of compare contrast, kind of like you would have kids compare and contrast Rome and Han empire broadly. So let's compare contrast women who rebelled against them. Um, so that's pretty neat. I also want to plug the Stanford history education group has a really awesome lesson plan on Cleopatra specifically that I think is, is a good one. And it's got some primary materials and things like that, that are worth having kids read. Um, and then actually while I'm on while I'm on Rome and, and Cleopatra <laughs> specifically, there's a series called Rome that um, basically does the history of Rome w- fr- from Caesar. And Cleopatra is one of the main characters in that series. And it's this on the history. Page? This is on Netflix. Oh. And um, it's really, really entertaining. They've got great actors in it. The Latin teacher across the hall recommended it to me. So I feel like hey, that says a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I feel like that's a pretty good sign if he's a proponent. So um and it, it confirms everything that I have known about Rome. So I think it's pretty historically accurate. Um, Great. And, and just Cleopatra is a main character. And so you kind of see how she's integral in the politics of the time. And there's some propaganda about her, you know, various relationships that she has with people. Um, and you get intimate into her world a little bit towards the end of the series. So oh. Who doesn't need something else to watch on Netflix right now? Yeah, I know. Quarantine recommendations. So two, yeah, you know, one drama series, one documentary, and a lesson plan for me available awesome. to people. Mixed media. We love it. Woohoo! <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. So I just want to take a minute and say how grateful we are to people who are writing reviews and um, donating to our Patreon page. It's just... It's so empowering and really uplifting and just wanted to spend a minute, you know, saying thank you and, you know, thank you for sharing our podcast and passing it along to people. And it's been a really, um, this is fun for us and we we're enjoying doing it. Um, and it's great to see that people are really excited about what we're up to. Yeah. We've had a lot of educators reach out to us in the last couple of weeks who are using some of the thoughts and ideas and going to the website and taking down some lesson plans. Um, we had a teacher from Oklahoma, Michael Wolf, uh, say he was excited to continue the cause of telling the whole history. And I love that. Um, so good job, Micah. Keep it up. Yeah, thank you so much to the people that are just kind of cheering us on um, and taking up the torch, if you will, for RBG and um, but for us as well. Just women are there, they're present, and their stories need to be heard. Totally. Yeah. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. <laughs> I love that. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.